Welcome to Alzheimer's Sunrise, lighting the way for patients and caregivers on Legends 100.3. Brought to you by Alzheimer's Community Care, providing help and hope for thousands of families for the past 20 years. Here's Mary Barnes, CEO of Alzheimer's Community Care. Welcome to Alzheimer's Sunrise, shining a light on patients and caregivers on Legends Radio 100.3 FM. I'm Mary Barnes, President and CEO of Alzheimer's Community Care. And I'm Karen Gilbert, Vice President for Education and Quality Assurance. And we have a special guest with us again this morning, Dr. Schutz, Jill Schutz. She's Assistant Professor and Doctorate of Nursing Practice Program at Palm Beach Atlantic University, one of our favorite, favorite partnerships that we have. We've had a long time relationship. Mm-hmm. with Palm Beach Atlantic. Yes, um, good morning. You, good morning. You're a geriatric. You're one of those very, very special but also rare geriatric nurse practitioners. You've been doing this for 20 years. Yes, you don't I look have. like you've been oh, doing Mary, this for 20 you. years. <laughs> and graduated from the University of Massachusetts. And before we went on the air, we've been talking about New England and accents and all that. So... Uh, it's it always as and you did that in 1997 and uh, you received your doctorate of nursing practice from Florida Atlantic University they have an outstanding program and um, you also um, are assistant professor at as I said before at Palm Beach Atlantic University um, you travel extensively Yes, I actually did when I worked at Florida Atlantic. Um, with I worked with Dr. Auslander, who uh-huh. is a world-renowned geriatrician. Mm-hmm. And we worked with um, a program called Interact, really focusing on educating caregivers, nursing assistants, and families about early changes in condition to prevent people from going back and forth into the hospital. So why were you traveling all when you have so many caregivers right in your own backyard? Right. What was the you know, premise for that? What was the... Uh, um, it was a grant through the National Institute of Health uh-huh. um, to educate hospital systems and nursing homes across the country about these early changes in condition. So we were hired privately. We were hired through the university. We worked on the grants, really just focusing on a national education to prevent those hospitalizations. Was when you were through doing that, Mm -hmm. was there any kind of publication that went out so these hospitals could read and they would perpetuate or keep going with this kind of? Absolutely, yeah. It actually has taken off quite a bit that it's now being incorporated into a lot of um, health information technology. A lot of um, electronic medical records have adopted um, Interact into their electronic records to guide the nurses and the nursing assistants to just really critically think and be able to identify those changes in condition earlier so that we could act earlier upon those changes and prevent that hospitalization. Now, we use Interact Mm -hmm. tools in our day centers and we adapted uh, the Interact Stop and Watch tool Mm -hmm. uh, so that we could identify the earliest changes in a patient. Our patients have Alzheimer's or related disorders. They cannot tell us when they are starting to feel ill or when they're in pain. And so we have to notice when they are just not themselves. And sometimes their vital signs are fine. It's not in the vital signs. It's in behavior. Absolutely. And we see those changes and get them seen in their physician or nurse practitioner's office Mm -hmm. so that they don't wind up in the emergency room or the hospital. Since Alzheimer's Community Care is where the rubber meets the road. Yes. And we work with families every day, Mm -hmm. every day. And we probably have in our daycares about 250 to 260 charts going through our system every day. Mm Mm-hmm. Hospitalization is a big deal. Right. And do you have any suggestions? And I know we didn't talk about this mm-hmm. in, the, in the past, but tools that we can give families so they can give their doctors? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and absolutely. pave the way? Yes. So when they are admitted on the floor, and, you know, it's also good because many times you have elective, elective you know, instead of just doing an emergency, 
if we could do it more as some sort of, of course, we all want to avoid any hospitalization. Mm -hmm. But when a patient goes into a hospital, right. is there tools that we can give that family so they can give their doctor? Yeah, ideally, it's even before they go into the hospital. So one of the things that I've learned from way back when is listen to the family and listen to the care provider, whether it be a lay person, whether it be the nursing assistant, whether it be the nurse, they are my eyes and ears in the family's home. So just recently I went and I saw um, a lady um, who's living independently and she looked fantastic for that 40 minutes I was with her. She actually has looked better than I have seen her in a long time. And two days later I got a phone call from her daughter saying my mom has been anxious for the past three weeks and what are we gonna do I'm like oh my gosh she was the most put together I have ever seen her she looks fantastic I did not see that her mom very proud woman puts herself together for the professional coming into the home but once I've left she falls apart and I didn't see that on a regular basis but her daughter received phone calls every morning so she's scheduled on my list today actually to see her, even though I just saw her last Saturday, I'm going to see her again to try and dig a little bit deeper and really figure out what this root cause is. Why is she having this anxiety? Why is she falling apart? Except for when I'm there visiting her, there must be something going on. So listening to the family with those very subtle changes in condition will prevent potentially that hospitalization. Yeah, we have tools for when somebody goes into the hospital to communicate better with the clinician. My goal is to prevent that hospitalization to altogether because we know when people with cognitive disorders um, with multiple medical conditions go into the hospital, it's not the best place for them if we could have prevented that um, to begin with. That's the goal. The interaction with the family, uh, we have found, um, we bring, there's no cookie cutter on how to mm -hmm. get the embracing of the disease and to get everybody kind of on the same page. Sometimes, almost in our, I've had experiences, it's taken several years because, first of all, there's yes. that big denial Yes. that, you know, I, I don't know why they're saying he's got Alzheimer's because I don't see it. Right. And so it takes a long time to uh, get, and once you start seeing the behaviors, which is always the biggest clue, um, then you start looking at, okay, what is, then, then what you want the family to say is, what do I need to be prepared for? Right. You know, and that in itself is a, is a, is a big, big leap, okay? But also, you, you really gotta prepare the family for the actual changes and just go with the flow because you really don't, there's no cookie cutter there either. You know, it depends on what the diagnosis is, what's the pathology of it, so. Absolutely, it's the denial that I think is the biggest piece that I run into in trying to educate them where we're headed with this concern. Um, and a lot of people are not ready to hear that because of the need for so much support through that process. What they've put in place, they don't even realize if they looked back five years and saw how slowly they started to add support in the home, they started taking over certain tasks that maybe the spouse or the parent couldn't do, but it's been such a slow, subtle change that they don't really realize it. That happens a lot for the clients I see every two, three months. I'm the one that often sees that huge change because the care provider is there every day and they're not noticing that change. But when I go in three months later, I say, oh my goodness, there's been a huge change because I haven't seen it every day. Because the disease is progressive. Absolutely. And, and, that's, and we have a saying around Alzheimer's Community Care that if you, uh, if you see you know, this, this situation and where that patient is at at a certain point in time and even the family, if we don't do anything, it's going to be different tomorrow. Right. It's going to be different tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So this is Alzheimer's Sunrise, shining a light on patients and caregivers at On Legends Radio 100.3. And um, when, you're, when you're actually getting into with the family, what if you can't get through that denial? 
What, what happens then? Well, oftentimes I'll bring in consultants. I'll bring in, I'll refer them. Sometimes hearing it from someone else might help. Sometimes, you know, calling Alzheimer's Community Care. I'd like you to just talk with a family nurse consultant and see how they can help you. Having somebody else come into the home and have a different conversation, maybe a different way. Because when they hear it often from different people, then it'll click more than just one person. Um, that, that happens, I would say that happens quite often. That Plus, I don't want to, it's a team sport here. Mm -hmm. Geriatrics, um, Dr. Auslander always says, this is a team um, process with geriatrics and especially with Alzheimer's. You need your team. I cannot personally care for a patient going through Alzheimer's by myself. And that's why I appreciate the support outside with Alzheimer's community care, with the neurologists, with social workers, with home care, everybody together working together to support not only the patient, but the family going through that process. So you have to bring in your other support from outside in order sometimes to get through that denial. I think that's so important also because lately Medicare has been talking about this a lot and they keep talking about patient-centered. When you mm -hmm. have neurocognitive mm -hmm. disorders, patient-centered is not good enough. Right. You need family-centered. You need all of these resources. Very, very important. Uh, if you'd like more information, you can call Alzheimer's Community Care at 561-683-2700. And you can also send us an email at info at allscare.org. And if you do, please tell us you heard us on Legends Radio. Now, the, getting back to some of your challenges that you have, I bet you've got a lot of neat kinds of circumstances that you can share. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I um, experience often is because we live in South Florida and many people have not been born in South Florida, they come from other states. So their children are elsewhere. So our patients that are experiencing Alzheimer's have family members in New York and Massachusetts and California and all over the place. And now they're aging in place and now their disease is getting worse and the support is outside of Florida. So how do you support someone where the family members are not necessarily seeing the decline on a regular basis? Um, they're maybe getting a phone call here and there. They're maybe experiencing um, maybe bills not being paid and they're getting notices of that, that their family member is not paying bills, but they live somewhere else. And oftentimes they're working full time and they have their children and they maybe have grandchildren. So for them to be able to pick up and just leave that home, leave that state and come to Florida to care for their aging parent, it's very difficult. So that's a huge hurdle to get through and that's just what we talked about, why we need our team to help that family outside of Florida care for that loved one here in South Florida. And that's where Alzheimer's Community Care really helps with that process, being able to refer someone there with the family nurse consultant to be able to help take care of that patient um, really just means the world. It really does. It, it, the um, support that you get from that community provider really um, can make the difference between someone being safe or unsafe in their home. Yeah, it's been a big challenge uh, for us uh, within the medical community as well to uh, really embrace the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, we hear a lot of families come in and they talk to us. Well, my husband doesn't have Alzheimer's. He has dementia. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what's the difference between Alzheimer's and why is the dementia uh, word so in so hard for us? In, in, for us, it's inappropriate We because dementia is not a disease. But it seems that in the medical community, they're treated like, they, they say it like it's a disease. No, he hasn't got Alzheimer's, he's got dementia. Right, you know, it, it's interesting. There's, there's many 
when I started, it was organic brain syndrome. So um, <laughs> Karen Gilbert is shaking her head up and down well, because and she remembers. That, it was before senility. That, senility. It was, yes. And yes. Nonspecific. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, very similar to, you know, using the word doctor or physician and, and should nurse practitioners be called doctor. It's kind of terminology that's thrown out there in the community and there's different um, stereotypes with having different diseases attached to you. Mm -hmm. So people think, oh, um, dementia is better than having Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's progresses faster than dementia. Um, you know, it's a it's a disease. It's a neurocognitive disorder that requires a team to care for these patients. Just like taking care of someone that has chronic comorbidities, they have diabetes and hypertension, and maybe they even have something like failure to thrive. They're not doing well at home. They're 97, and all of these diseases are kind of coming to a head. They're all just very at their end stages. It requires a group to care for these patients regardless of what the diagnosis is from what I see. Whether a patient has Alzheimer's, they have vascular dementia, they have Lewy body dementia, they have multi-infarct dementia, I am still providing the same type of teamwork um, to care for these patients. They still all require a team to care for them. Um, I don't have a special um, pocket of tricks that I can use for someone that has Alzheimer's versus someone that has a Lewy body dementia as far as how much support I provide in the home. They all go through a continued progressive decline in their disease and they need more and more support as this disease progresses. But some of those, <clears throat> those diseases have um, other types of uh, like seizures more often than say not or yes. there could be medication. If we don't understand the actual disease, and that's why we at, we're at Alzheimer's Community Care advocate for that proper, di the appropriate diagnosis. Yes. Because it's, you know, it. I think there's a thought out there sometimes I hear, well, dementia is dementia. I mean, it's, oh, right. it's like, okay, and they dismiss it. The mm -hmm. problem is that you can't really work on a good patient plan. If Absolutely. you don't understand what they're dealing with, what we're dealing with, and that's what we get frustrated about. Yes. And uh, there's this, I think there's too much of a casualness about using the word Alzheimer's right off the top mm -hmm. of the head without really digging and to finding it because Lewy bodies is much different than Alzheimer's. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things in working at a family nurse practitioner program, um, so the family nurse practitioner can take care of birth through death, a patient that has been, is an infant all the way up through geriatrics. Um, as a geriatric nurse practitioner, um, I feel like my role is to educate those family nurse practitioners mm -hmm. on just what we're talking about. Yes. Absolutely. Because once, um, there are not many geriatricians that are out there that care truly just for that geriatric patient, right? And my goal is to make sure that the nurse practitioners going through a family nurse practitioner program understand the differences, um, understand what it, um, how different it is to take care of someone that is older, that has these neurocognitive disorders, as opposed to, you know, someone that um, maybe just goes through a program that, um, doesn't have an emphasis on geriatrics. Actually, many of our students come through Alzheimer's Community Care to do their practicum projects. Because they have that interest and that focus. Yes. There uh, is often a lot of misunderstanding about what a nurse practitioner can do and what the scope of practice is in Florida. Can you spend a couple of moments uh, sure. explaining that to yeah, us? Yeah, absolutely. I. Um, I originally got my license in uh, Massachusetts, so I was licensed in three different states as a nurse practitioner. Um, the state regulations allow scope of practice to be different in each state. So when I was working in uh, Maryland, I had my DEA, which allowed me to prescribe controlled substances, and that was in 19, from 1998 to 2000. Um, I could 
prescribed controlled substances. I moved down here in 2001, and all of a sudden that was removed from me. And 17 years later, um, the last State of the Union, we were finally able to, in Florida, um, effective last January, now prescribe controlled substances. But it took 17 years and many people going to Tallahassee many times to um, uh, change that. Why is that important? Because that expands our scope of practice. Nurse practitioners in Florida can prescribe, they can treat um, congestive heart failure, diabetes, the simple cold. Um, some nurse practitioners are working in orthopedics. Some are working just strictly in pediatrics. There are family nurse practitioners. There are psychiatric nurse practitioners, all with different scopes of practice. Um, an interesting thing is that a few years ago, they actually removed the ANCC certification for um, geriatric nurse practitioners. I heard that. And why would they do that? <laughs> it blew my mind because um, I don't know if you've heard the term silver tsunami, but I use that often, that now all the baby boomers are um, reaching the, the 65 plus, and we're going to have the most amount of elderly here as specifically in Florida, and now they took away that, um, that specialty. Cer specialty. Um, I'm fortunately able to keep mine, as all were certified prior to or able to, but there was not an interest in going into um, purely geriatrics, so they expanded it to adult geriatrics. Um, when you do that, you do water down the education to some degree um, because now they're learning adult 18 to 120 instead of just um, right. 65 plus. Um, my focus on my education was really just 65 and over. So, but back to what can the nurse practitioner do? We prescribe. So if you need, um, if you're being treated for hypertension, yes, we can take care of your hypertension. We can take care of your diabetes. If it gets outside of our scope of practice, which is something that we know what we can prescribe. So if you're on three different blood pressure medications and your blood pressure is still not being managed, we refer you to your cardiologist in order to get some support um, from the cardiologist, as well as if your diabetes is out of control, we'll have you go see that diabetes specialist, the endocrinologist, to get some support, but we can still manage that. Um, in our practice. How do we practice? We do not practice um, alone. We have to have a collaborative relationship with a physician currently um, in the state of Florida, although there are many states that do not have to um, collaborate with a physician. The nurse practitioners can practice independently. There's been some talk with the new nurse compact where nurses can have a, yes. a multi-state license because nursing really doesn't change from state to state. The <laughs> concepts are the same. Yes. So it'd be great if everybody had equal access. There was something you mentioned a bit ago about seeing a patient in her home. Yes. And it's, um, it's uh, so exciting to see something old is new again. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the benefit of that home visit, being able to see someone in place? Absolutely. It, it's been my passion for many years to be able to see people where they live. When they come into the office, just like what I talked about before, they can hold it together um, in that office setting. They get dressed up. It's an event, um, and you don't see them in their home environment. When you go into the home environment, you can see that the diabetic has um, fruit loops on top of the refrigerator. Um, you can see that the rooms are disheveled and that maybe they need help cleaning. Maybe they have clutter in the home. Maybe it's that patient that doesn't have um, a very good memory whose stove is still plugged in and perhaps that's not really a good thing to, um, and, and you can look into the home and see um, if they have the medication there that they need. So um, those home visits, we just recently got a letter from um, a family that, uh, just like you said, it is so nice to have somebody come in with their little black bag and sit down without distraction in the office and give full undivided attention to our father. And that's what they get with the home visit. Undivided attention, um, specialized attention for a half hour to 40 minutes. Um, and oftentimes it's once a month. 
Um, and it's um, it really makes the difference between having them go into the hospital, having their disease progress rapidly or slowly. Well, I think that uh, we're lucky to have a, uh, a dedicated professional like you in our community. And uh, I just hope that we can multiply more. I know that in healthcare industry, we have an absolute extreme shortage. And you're right about the tsunami that we've got. And I don't understand. And we've been talking about it mm -hmm. for 10, 15 years. I know that we mm -hmm. have been talking about it, Alzheimer's Community Care. And I just can't believe that there's been such a hands-off approach. Why we are not out on every street corner trying to recruit every special student that would like to get into some form of medical care because uh, we do have a very big population and the talent pool is getting harder and harder and we're all competing yes. for the person like you and we value the caring that you bring to it and the expertise and the and the and not only that, but the instincts that you bring. It's, it's, we're all human. The human condition has kind of been like, you know, left out of the equation. And everybody wants to, do like, you give up aspirin for this or you give a, a treatment for that. And it's not that easy. Right. It's not that easy. We've learned a lot more and the, over the years about that. Even our diets, the way we do our diets, it's, it's personal medicine. Right. And that's what we're striving for and educating everybody that we feel that you've got to be an advocate for yourself and you've got to make sure that your family is getting the right kind of medical attention. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to Alzheimer's Sunrise, shining a light on patients and caregivers on Legends Radio 100.3 FM. Call Alzheimer's Community Care at 561-683-2700 or send us an email, info at allscare.org. That's A-L-Z-C-A-R-E dot org. And do tell us you heard us on Legends Radio. Thanks for listening to Alzheimer's Sunrise, lighting the way for patients and caregivers. To learn more about the help and hope available from Alzheimer's Community Care, call 561-683-2700 or visit allscare.org. That's A-L-Z-Care.org. Tune in next Sunday at 6.30 for another edition of Alzheimer's Sunrise, lighting the way for patients and caregivers, right here on Legends 100.3.